I really feel like in a PWI, again, that it, the attitude I feel is every person for themselves. It's not about family. It's not about community. It's about if you don't make it, that's on you. Which I just don't think that's how it should be, but that's how it is. <laughs> let me, let me, let me, let me, let me push back, Mara. Okay. Um, but at HBCU, so many people don't make it. Why don't they make it? Though? So, so many people, I, I, I don't know, but I know through the numbers, so many more people at HBCUs don't make it. So Too many beautiful girls. <laughs> Distractions, exactly. <laughs> Distractions. <laughs> I said distractions. That is a true statement. But but no, I get it. Like I get the community community feel. I also wanted to mention uh, in in the chat, Cassandra said HBCUs came from uh, Tucson, Arizona, and help you know your worth, which is great. But we talk about it at some schools, but we talk about a graduation rate that is at fifty percent, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering what. So, something's missing, like something is not happening. Uh, when you have like a PWI, like Berkeley, for example, I think it's in the in the upper in the upper 80s, right? The graduation uh, rate. And so I'm 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 wondering, like homecoming is dope and all that stuff is cool, but what what is lacking in terms of seeing our black students through from the beginning to the end? Fresh killer. <laughs> What a tribe. In the summer of 2020, McCord Maker became the highest ranking basketball player to ever commit to an HBCU when he selected Howard University. On January 20th, Howard graduate Kamala Harris began serving her term as vice president of the United States. NFL Hall of Famer Deion Sanders is bringing a whole lot of positive media attention to Jackson State as their head football coach. The young actress Storm Reed went viral when she opened up her acceptance letter to Spelman College. Former Heisman Trophy winner and NFL Rookie of the Year Eddie George was recently hired as the head football coach of Tennessee State University. It seems as though HBCUs are making more noise than ever before, which begs the question, are they the best option for the higher education of African-American students? HBCUs, unfortunately, often have very low graduation rates and suffer from what InsideHigherEd.com once referred to as deep-rooted dysfunction. I'm here to discuss this issue with beautiful Black people from all over the country, from Oakland to Atlanta to DC, and a few places in between. Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to chop it up. My first question for you all is, uh, do you, have you all been feeling this push towards HBCUs in the past year or so? Uh, and if you have been feeling that, why now? And I will yield the floor. I agree with that, definitely. Like with Kamala being in the White House now, it's been like spotlighted for sure. Because I don't. Think oh, I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you. I don't think there's anybody that's as famous as her. I mean, not famous, but what's the word I'm looking for that would draw attention to an HBCU as much as she would? I agree. I mean, I I feel that right. Good, prominent. Yeah, a prominent figure that people are going to know regardless of race about drawing attention towards the HBCU. I would say that I agree with the person who said I haven't necessarily seen a push, mm -hmm. but um, I do feel like there's kind of this resurgence of pride in HBCUs um, for people who have attended. And I think it's kind of what you're talking about because there are now people who are so prominent. Um, people that I've known who've gone to those schools really just, you know, are getting really, really excited all over again, which I think is cool, so. Okay. I think because I'm here now, I, I've lived in California for almost two years now. And if I was back home, I feel like I would feel that surge that's been coming up because of all these people coming out of HBCUs. But now I'm here in, HBCUs are not really a thing out here and the people that I'm around haven't really heard of HBCUs so I don't get to hmm. talk about it as much mm -hmm. but if I was back home like that's something that we would talk about like oh so-and-so went to Howard so-and-so went here 
And there's not really that discourse here, at least not in my circle of friends. So home is South Carolina and where are you now? I'm in California in the Bay Area. You're in California. Oh, oh my goodness. A lot of people from California go down to HBCUs. Though. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. Like when I was at Clark, the largest out-of-state population came from California. Like, wow. Most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I do want to recognize in the chat that Hazel said, I think with, uh, with Beyonce's performance at Coachella, uh, it, it made an exciting experience. Uh, like people have a lot of pride, okay? Um, so do, I, I was just wondering, uh, so with Beyonce and I, it feels bigger than before. Am I making that up? I mean, it just feels like, let's throw Beyonce in there as well. But it seems like, for example, when I was coming out of high school, it didn't, Black people knew about HBCUs, but it wasn't all of this press. And uh, I'm just wondering how that's impacting people. I know we have some people on the call that went to HBCUs. And do you feel like, do you feel that pride? Do you feel an extension of that pride when you see things like Kamala Harris and Beyonce representing and, and all of that? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Hey. Coachella was really, um, I, I feel like Coachella was definitely like, if you had never gone to HBC, you got that experience at Coachella, like, you know, and it just, you know, you, it just watching the video of it just made me feel like homecoming, like all over again, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was just, it was very, I don't know, it was very enjoyable, let's just say. So. I totally agree with you. Totally do. Just watching the video makes you feel like you're at homecoming. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if the PWIs, it, it just, I don't think it's the same. <laughs> yeah. You don't, you don't think homecoming is the same, you mean? <laughs> no, I, so when I was in like middle school, high school, um, I was in this group that you, and it was like a, a college prep group and my church used to take us to um, like the HBCUs in South Carolina for their homecomings. And I used to love just watching the shows. Like I had no idea about their academics, but I knew I loved watching the marching band. <laughs> I knew I liked the atmosphere. Um, and especially when Stomp the Yard came out, it was like, Oh yeah. Late, later in my high school years, I was like, I'm going to apply to HBCUs. <laughs> and I didn't end up going to one, but I think that exposure really made me want to go to HBCUs. And I think Beyonce's Coachella did the same thing for students who were my age when Stomp the Yard came out. Okay. I'd like to piggyback on Brianna's comment, not just the one that she made, but the one before about the attitudes um, towards HBCUs. Maybe it's more so the Bay Area, I don't know, but there aren't a lot of trips that go out there. So it really isn't discussed. Um, it's more focused on UC Berkeley and STEM programs. And so when you're taking trips, you're taking trips to those colleges that have high accepted rates um, so that what, you come back to San Francisco or San Jose or Palo Alto and work for a tech firm. So um, I think, yeah, there is a, a difference as far as just the excitement, but I can say, I think we're all proud of the achievements that all of these um, individuals have accomplished, um, especially from an HBCU. Hey, uh, let me, Holly, do you see and do you take issue with that, with Black students in the Bay Area uh, being shopped around local schools and not taking those trips uh, down south and in, in, into Howard and Hampton uh, to see the HBCUs? Um, that's a tough question. I can honestly say for myself, I took more issue with those who didn't attend and especially white counterparts. Um, I remember saying, oh, I wanna to go to Clark Atlanta. And this one guy's um, comment was, why would you wanna to go to a predominantly black school? Like any school is you know, good. I would never pick something based on race. 
I didn't bother answering this guy. I just kind of gave him the stink guy because I'm like, obviously <laughs> you don't know yourself and you don't know your people. And it really shouldn't matter if I want to be at an HBCU because um, the majority are black or if it's just an excellent school. Like I shouldn't have to answer that question for you. Um, so I don't take issue with that um, about a student who, who wants to go to something that they feel will give them a leg up, especially in the STEM program. I, I just don't. But I do feel like there should be some kind of option um, and the comfort of having that option. A guy like him, he's like pushing back on even there being an option. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. And I and I feel like HBCUs, especially at the undergrad level, you know, you can go on to graduate school at a PWI or wherever you want to go. But I think, you know, it builds a foundation, it builds confidence, it builds, you know, self-identity, it builds just a, a, a place where you're supported and loved and you may have the confidence. Maybe you came from so for example, I came from basically Catholic backgrounds with school, white schools. I grew up in Ohio, right? So there was that element of maybe a little bit of inferiority at Coda HBCU, you know, self-esteem goes up. I played volleyball there, had a full scholarship. You know, my, my, my um, professors were supportive. I got involved in a bunch of things. And then from there went on to other schools with a lot more awareness of self confidence and, and perceived worth, you know, of what I could do in the world because of a, of a HBCU and the professors and the experience of it all basically, but maybe some, kids don't need that. Maybe they come from family, like Michelle Obama. I always think about how she came from a home where she was already, always lift up, lifted up and encouraged and just knew that she could do what she did. But everybody doesn't have that, you know, coming out of their home too. So I just think it's a place that you can really grow and nurture yourself and be and feel safe um, being Black at an HBCU, that you'll be respected and treated with care. I should I should say that in the chat, uh, Cassandra said the publicity of HBCUs, perhaps it goes and comes in waves. Uh, and she referenced school days as also. Oh, yeah. also and let's not forget a different world as mm -hmm. well while while we're on it. Exactly. Um, so for, for my HBCU people, uh, what are some things that students should know about the HBCU experience uh, before they enroll? What are some things that they should know? What are some things they should prepare for? Distractions, lots of them. <laughs> but isn't that at all colleges though? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, distractions like at, at you guys HBCUs did they um, as freshmen did they have the the silly visitation rules and um, <laughs> and curfew for six weeks? Yeah, so I, I went to I went to Clark my freshman year and like yes, uh, the boys could not have a female guest for yeah for the first yes that was that was happening. <laughs> Yeah, and then at, at Hampton, at Hampton, the the girls' dorms were kind of on one side, the the guys' dorms were kind of on on the other side, mm -hmm. and uh, they were very strict with rules, uh, with uh, with guys being in the girls' dorms, especially initially, but mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't the same the other way around. Uh, the girls would slip on a baseball cap and, and come on in. <laughs> it wasn't exactly the same, but uh, learning to deal with those adults, uh, those rules and what have you, I think it it uh, it made us stronger and like uh, made our friendships stronger compared to if we just had all of the initial freedoms that you have at a PWI. All right, for sure. Any, any, anything else as far as that HBCU experience and what you might, uh, what students should know going into it? I, I think it's tough if you've never been, if, if, if your first experience away from your home is going to an HBCU and you're like, if you're not from that state and you're going out of state to another school and an HBCU at the same time, <laughs> 
I think that could be a little challenging in terms of overexposure and just feeling like this sense of great independence. But I don't know if that's just a college student period. You know, others that didn't go to HBCU, is that how it is when you went to college, if you weren't from that state or were from that state and went away from school? I mean, went from home to a school, did you feel overwhelmed or a sense of independence? Well, I went to school in my own state, but when I came here for grad school, that was a big change, just trying to work and then understand California culture and go to school. It was a lot more than I thought it was. And so I can't imagine what it's like being an undergraduate and doing all that. So big ups to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, for sure. So, so listen, I, I know we have people on the call that went to both PWIs, predominantly white institutions, and you went to HBCUs. I experienced that as well. And I just want to put it out there. Which one do you think is better for the education of Black students? I want people to speak uh, unfiltered. I want people to, to, to not hold back. And I want people to give your honest opinions about which do you think uh, is the better option? I think it should be both mm -hmm. because HBCUs are going to give you some things that you can't get anywhere else. But once we graduate, uh, a lot of the time we work with predominantly white people uh, and it's good to have that also. So I would say both. You need to have both. Now, uh, there are a ton of PWIs, and you can just go to a PWI, but you won't have the experiences I had. So um, don't run up against me because I'm going to have too much experience uh, dealing with uh, plenty of situations that I couldn't even begin to start to tell you about uh, not only academically and in business, but socially as well, which is very important. So uh, it would be good if you could experience a little of both. And it doesn't have to be um, during undergrad because a lot of us have come from, uh, from high school and junior, junior high um, with a lot of white and a lot of mixed races. So uh, I did my undergrad. Go ahead, go ahead. At go ahead. an HBCU. Right. So right. I think that that's a good way to do it from age 18 to 22 to, uh, to have that undergrad HBCU experience and then continue on with life. Well, let me, let me ask you this, Jason, because you went from Hampton University to Harvard, am I correct? That's correct, that's correct. Do you think that Hampton University prepared you academically to perform well at Harvard? Um, I was in the School of Science. I have a degree in molecular biology and I could tell that there was a lot more money and resources at the PWIs and in the School of Science in terms of like uh, equipment. I could tell that there was a lot more money there, but the academics and uh, the foundation that we had allowed me to go, go anywhere. So I wouldn't say that I was disadvantaged, but when I would look around in the laboratories, I could definitely tell that there was a lot more money uh, pumped into the white schools. And it, it looked a whole lot like uh, the laboratories after you graduate and you start uh, getting a work and you work in the lab. Now, I don't work in the laboratory anymore. Um, I'm an airline pilot now. And um, like uh, the science that I've learned is pretty much applied toward aviation. But initially, when I uh, first finished school, I had jobs in the laboratory and I did cloning and DNA extractions and things like that. And it looked a lot more like the white schools than the black schools because they just didn't have that type of equipment yet. But it's been a long time and I'm sure that that gap has closed. 
Okay, for sure. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Any anyone else? You know, the P PWI or the HBCU. Anyone else here to weigh in on that? I mean, I think just so academically, I feel like I was fine to go wherever I wanted to go after A and T. I think what A and T. How do I want to put this? More about um, how do you survive in an environment. Um, the social aspect, like the 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 networking, the who do you know, that aspect of being an undergrad, you know, connecting, um, study groups, things like that. Because at the at the PWIs, it's like kind of every man, every man, woman for themselves is what I experience. If you don't make it, that's on you. But at an HBCU, you get the foundation of we're all together, and let me kind of. I'll help you, let's help each other. So I think that gives you sort of a good, I guess it, for me, I'll speak for myself, it just gave me a good baseline to be able to do whatever I need to do, no matter where I went, basically, um, from going to an HBCU. The social aspect and the academic aspect I was more prepared for, um, I feel, which, and they're so different in a PWI compared to an HBCU, the social aspect, I really, I really feel like in a PWI, again, that it, the attitude I feel is every person for themselves. It's not about family. It's not about community. It's about if you don't make it, that's on you. Which I just don't think that's how it should be, but that's how it is. <laughs> let me, let me, let me, let me, let me push back, Mara. Okay. Um, but at HBCU, so many people don't make it. Why don't they make it though? So many people, I, I, I don't know, but I know through the numbers, so many more people at HBCUs don't make it. So too many beautiful girls. <laughs> distractions, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> distractions. For, for sure. I said distractions. I, that is a true statement. But, but no, I get it. Like I get the community, community feel. I also wanted to mention uh, in, in the chat, Cassandra said HBCUs came from uh, Tucson, Arizona to help you know your worth, which is great. But we talk about it at some schools, but we talk about a graduation rate that is at 50%. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what some, something's missing, like something is not happening. Uh, when you have like a PWI, like Berkeley, for example, I think it's in the in the upper in the upper 80s, right? The graduation. Uh, rate and so I'm 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 wondering like homecoming is dope and all that stuff is cool, but what what is lacking in terms of seeing our black students through from the beginning to the end? I I'll say um, so I went to Georgia State, which you know is designated as a PWI, but it's it's in Atlanta, so it's a pretty pretty black school. Um, I think for us, you know. It definitely was not an HBCU, but there were so many Black people there with such a strong sense of community. Um, not the most Black faculty, but enough um, to where I think a lot of us who you know were around at that time didn't necessarily feel like there was a lack of that. Um, and I'll say that Georgia State students graduated. You know, Spelman, Morehouse, um, Clark, Morris Brown, those schools are right around the corner, and a lot of those students just didn't finish. Um, because they didn't necessarily have the services at those schools as the one young man, uh, what's his name, Jason was saying, um, the services weren't necessarily embedded in the same way. Um, and I think that's really important. Like you're, people are young and they're trying to figure it out, distracted, you know, all of that. Um, so I think in terms of which one is best, I think it really depends on where you can graduate from. Uh, at the end of the day, that's, you know, you're not spending all that money to, you know, do anything else really. <laughs> you're there to get a degree. But is graduation based on the school or is that based on you? As a, is that based on you, your foundation, mm -hmm. your mindset, your thought process? I mean, yeah. so, I mean, I don't know if I could say, I mean, definitely the statistics speak one way, right? So it's, can't argue with those, but I think also you, you, you have to have a certain mindset about school as well mm -hmm. too. And with HBCUs, okay, yeah, they have a lower graduation rate, but an HBCU may let you come back and complete your degree, or if you take some time away versus like a PWI, if you are done, you are done, right? They don't let you back in, do they, to let you finish if you have a, I guess if you 
failed or or whatever i don't know i would say um that it's important to remember that school is a business and every student that is enrolled in an HBCU is a dollar for that university. Mm -hmm. And so my experience having gone to a white school, but plenty of friends and colleagues who went to black schools, some finished and some didn't. And it's, I think it's exactly what you said. It doesn't really matter on the back end, any of that other stuff, unless you finish and the school is gonna accept you because you're a dollar. Like someone is funding you, you know, to be at that school financial aid or your own pockets or whatever it is. Um, and so I think when you do like the return on your investment kind of an analysis as an individual, not from the school's point of view, I think that's the thing that sometimes is missing from these conversations about the debate between one school versus the other. I think if you really want a communal experience, and you can graduate, then there's no, why wouldn't you go to an HBCU? But if there are other things you need and you also need to graduate, maybe it's not the best option. And clearly, you know, I'm just speaking from my own experience, but that's just sort of what I, what I see in the landscape. So are you, so um, tell me how to say your name, I'm sorry. It's Renier. Renier, so yeah. are you saying that a student that might and correct me if I'm wrong, are you saying a student that might not, like if they're not strong minded, right? Or they may need supportive services, a person of color, they might wanna go to a PWI where they'll get more support and services versus an HBCU where they might have too many distractions that might not allow them to graduate. I would say if you are a student coming out of high school and who's struggling, you should go where you can get the support. And if that's a PWI, then that's what it is. If it's an HBCU, that's what it is. Um, I think, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Okay. I think you both raise an interesting point. If I can just interject, because um, I know I wasn't successful in the beginning and to speak to Mara's point, about having the mindset, I went back much later, ready to get the degree. Cause I lived in Texas and I was just like, well, I worked my way up in California, but the degree is important even mm -hmm. for a low level job. So I know that I need to get this piece of paper if nothing else to say that, yeah, I know how to learn and, and do X, Y, Z. But at that school, which was very much, you succeed or you're successful um, because of this, but if you fail, it's, it's your fault. Um, the women who were not just women of color, they were um, Black women, were so focused on the Black students that were coming in. And I honestly, I've had, I mean, there were so much microaggressions from white professors, white students, and to have that support. And, and I don't know if it was better because I was part of the few, so I got a lot more attention, um, but I am very grateful to those women who were so focused on my success because I really think I would have fell through the cracks regardless of the fact that I knew that I was at a, that it was more mature coming in the second time around. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, I wanted that, to say- Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I'll keep it fast. I wanted to say that in order to graduate in my experience, it took a lot of resources and also a lot of determination. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say resources, I mean like uh, mm -hmm. having parents who are knowledgeable and family support, mm -hmm. that type of thing you can't replace. Mm -hmm. And- Oh, did he freeze? Then okay. once you get oh. there, it doesn't matter in order to to actually graduate. That's where your own determination has to come in in order to finish. And a resource that I found on campus was, well, uh, you guys know that not many black men uh, graduate, not many, uh, compared to the, to the black females in the graduation line. A lot more of the black females who started actually finish compared to compared to the guys mm -hmm. and what guys don't always know is that those black women that are ahead of you and know the classes you're getting ready to take are great resources 
and black women are just phenomenal resources and will carry you to where you need to go uh-oh you <laughs> I'm glad you said it, bro. <laughs> could you could you further expound on that, Jason? What do you what do you what, what do you mean by that, sir? Okay, the distractions. The guys always chasing uh, the girls on a social level, or just trying to sleep with them, or whatever socially type of thing. Uh huh. That might be abundant, you know, at HBCUs and other colleges too. But if you're trying to graduate. There's so much more that Black women, who especially who have come maybe a year or two before you are familiar with exactly what you need to do to matriculate, that is a super valuable resource to use them to mentor you because they're going to graduate and you don't want to be the one who doesn't graduate. Okay. Because you guys are very close then, but if they graduate and keep doing so well and you don't, it won't be as good for you in the future when you try to speak to the, the same Black woman or one like her. So yes, they look great. They're young. They're in shape. They're wearing fancy clothes. They look wonderful. Mm -hmm. But they can help you graduate. There you go. Okay. Let me, let me, let me, okay. I want to know what the sisters feel about that. You said you said that instead, instead of just just to be fair, instead of just trying to get with a girl and 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 you know hook up with her and all that, you should talk to her on an academic level to help you to succeed in school. And I'm wondering. I was reading the faces of the black women on the call, and I'm wondering how how do the sisters feel about that sentiment. <laughs> No thoughts. <laughs> I'll, I'll be the brave soul, whatever. <laughs> I am going to give this brother much grace for, uh, I know because I know exactly what he's trying to say. Um, and I'm going to allow myself to not be in my feelings about the, the language um, of, of, of using black women to dot, dot, dot. Like, uh, and I'll, I'll use this to kind of pivot into the importance of um, community at whatever institution you find yourself, be that at HBC or a PWI. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, if you're in it for the right reason, so to speak, then you're there to, to get a degree. And sometimes you have to use whatever resource you have to, to make that happen. Um, and I guess what he's saying in this instance, um, a resource that was valuable to him has been the, the women that he came across. I'll leave it at that. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> any, any, anyone else on that? Uh, and I'm just going to say, I heard, what I heard Jason say was that Black women are smart. You need to get with one so you can pass and get out of school. That's what I heard him say. Good job, Mara. Good <laughs> job, <laughs> girl. Good job. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There yes, you and go. in the academic way. I'm speaking about yeah. academics. Right. I'm talking okay. about brains. Of course. Specific. Brains. Yeah. And yeah, black women have too yeah. many, too many brains. All right, for sure. He's talking about brains. He's talking about brains. All right, for sure. Uh, in the chat, uh, an interesting question from Ms. Hazel Monet, who says, are there different types of rigor at HBCUs? I've heard folks speak poorly about Norfolk State versus Howard. Can anyone speak on that? Different, the, the, the spectrum of HBCUs. Does anyone have any experience with that? I mean, so I'll just speak from a and So a and graduates, uh, number one, you know, Black engineers at all levels, undergrad, master's, and graduate degree. So I would say, yeah, you know, there might be a difference in rigor based on this, based on the institutions the schools have and what they're turning out for students. So it, it's quite possible for sure. But I think, isn't that at any school though? Like, isn't, isn't it different at all schools that what you're going to get from that school in terms of rigor and, and preparation? I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. All right. For sure. Any, any, anyone else on that, uh, on that uh, spectrum? Okay. For, for keeping it honest, there are different levels. Oh, okay. Well, Cassandra, you, oh, I see Renge. I caught Renge nodding. 
And <laughs> Renge, you being a Southern girl from Georgia. I don't know why Georgia, you calling me out. <laughs> you, you, you being uh, a Southern girl from Georgia, what do you know about this, this alleged spectrum? I am not a higher educational, you know, higher education professional. Mm -hmm. Let me just say that out of the box. Sure. Um, but I did go to school around the corner from uh, one HBCU that is, I went around the corner, not too far from Morris Brown, right? So just as an example of an HBCU, just one of many, right? All right, um, Morris Brown. Yeah, go ahead. And so there, you know, they've been on a, on a journey to resurrect, so to speak. Um, but there was a period of time where Georgia State was getting a lot of students from uh, Morris Brown. They were having their challenges. And a lot of them just simply couldn't compete, right? You know, I went to a state school, but it's definitely one of the top tier research universities. So I was interested in sciences and, you know, social sciences, hard sciences, that kind of thing. And the students just couldn't compete. And I always wonder um, if that had to do with what it took to get into the school in the first place, right? So someone talked about at the start of this conversation, you know, what you need when you're graduating high school and entering college. And I always sort of got the feeling that, you know, Spelman probably is, is completely removed from this conversation because they excel on all levels, right? Um, but I always sort of felt like the rigor wasn't necessarily there. Like they didn't have the requirements that were uh, the highest level to get in in the first place. And so what it took to get out, you know, was along the same levels and, and schools are ranked like there, there are different levels of rigor, there are different levels of um, success people have after finishing a four year degree. Um, so I, I would if you know hypothetically if I were to have children I would highly encourage my children to go to HBCU if that's what they wanted to do. But more than that, I would want them to get the best education that they could get and. I don't necessarily feel like that's always at an HBCU. Mm. I'm curious to hear from the people who went to HBCUs um, because I'm sure, you know, clearly we're all seemingly working professionals. So I'm curious to hear about <laughs> the young man here nodding his head real hard. Let's, let's hear it. <laughs> but let me, hold on. Let me, let me speak to the ABC because. Right. I, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So went from, went from Cali down to, down to Clark as a freshman. And I did realize a spectrum as soon as I got there, I realized that, uh, so there was a, a housing project um, right next to my school. And if some students lived in, I, I wanna say it was called, a, ah, like the courts. So, with, mm -hmm. so okay, so the, the, the promenade was here where most of the buildings were and the courts were here. In between the promenade and most of the building and the courts was a housing project, okay? okay. And so I want to get back to what Mara was saying, like all schools, there's a spectrum of all schools, absolutely. Some schools, uh, some schools are known as party schools and underachievers. This is among PWIs, among white schools. And some are like elite schools, absolutely, that's true. But, but I don't know of many of these PWIs um, that are next to housing projects, and not just any housing project, but active, legit housing projects where people are getting smoked. I, I, I mean, and I'm from the hood, you know what I'm saying? DP Stokeland, you know what it is. Like I'm, I'm from the hood, but it's something about being in a different hood on the other side of the country and paying an exorbitant amount of money <laughs> to be going to a school which is next to a housing project, right? And so to get to this spectrum, Spellman was in a gate. Yes. <laughs> Spellman is gated <laughs> Locked all. down. Everybody has to check in before they go on to Spellman's campus. Do you understand? Morehouse, not a gate, but not next to the projects, right? So there, there's a Spelman here, Morehouse here, Clark here, housing project, right? And the proximity to the housing project reflected in, in, into how good the school was supposed to be. There was a hierarchy and it was very pronounced. And I remember going there and um, I was, grateful i want to i want to i don't i don't just want to diss my situation at clark because 
no school in the state of California let me in out of high school. I want to make that clear. Um, they all rejected me. <laughs> um, I got rejected from Cal State Stanislaw at a high school. No disrespect for the people in Stanislaw, but when you get that letter that says you are not Stanislaw material, it hits you a little bit different. So, so Clark gave me a chance. They saw something in me and I can never take that away from them. No matter what I achieve, Clark gave me a chance as an 18 year old young man from East Oakland. However, being in that space and, and typing a paper at my friend's dorm in Brawley Hall and hearing a gunshot and seeing the ambulance come and pick up a body while I'm trying to write this paper was something that I did not appreciate. And I will say also shout out to Clark. I went back there in October of 2020. That building has been torn down, right? The, the, the housing projects has, have, have been torn down so I, future students to go to Clark, you won't have to worry about that. But it was somewhat hurtful for me to be in that space, to go to this HBCU and have to experience that. And so when you speak to a spectrum, I'm going to speak to that. And I know Jason's been wanting to get in for a long time, but that was part of my experience at an HBCU. And I think that when we talk about pride and the band and all those things, we also need to talk about the reality of there's a large chance that you're going to be either in the hood or right next door to the hood. Have you guys um, been been on Hampton's campus? Is or is, is it just me? Uh, it's beautiful. Oh, okay. yo. Oh no. Yeah, Hampton's yeah. campus is beautiful. I know that's what he's Um if you haven't been on here, I probably wouldn't be um said there's yachts and marinas yeah. and stuff on campus. It's okay. different than what we know in East Oakland. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Um so me around around Hampton's campus and uh, probably not the good example, probably not the best example, but I know some more of you can speak better about what he's telling you. When I went to USC, it's in Columbia. And so Columbia, if you don't know, is on for first 48 all the time, like crime is everywhere. <laughs> but on USC's campus, we felt safe. But Benedict and Allen were right down the street and they were in the middle of the ghetto. And like, even the black students at USC were like, ooh, Benedict is in the ghetto. And so like, even black students had that mindset where like, not necessarily that we're better, but it's, it's just a different atmosphere. And like, I can't imagine being not only like at a school in the ghetto, but like, seeing other HBCUs that are like in a higher place or a, a better place than you are. And you're thinking, oh, I'm going to somewhere where we're all ranked high and you still feel some type of way. <laughs> Cassandra points out that uh, USC, the University of Southern California in Los Angeles is in a hood as well. <laughs> <laughs> shout out shout out to you for the clap back um that <laughs> it is gated off though right <laughs> that's what brianna was saying though wasn't that what you were saying brianna i was talking about usc in south carolina southern california here now south carolina <laughs> <laughs> Don't come for us, because I'm just saying. <laughs> okay, 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 for sure, for sure. I just, um, you know, there, there, there were some things when I was there, and I just, um, I didn't, I, I wanted there to be, like, improvement, because I thought that there was so much potential, like, to, to improve certain things, and, um, 
it, the, the, the energy didn't seem to be placed in that direction as far as, as far as making things, making things better um, for students. For sure, for sure. Jason, Jason, you ready for us, man? Uh, I don't know. I'm in, I'm in a, I'm in a different room now. You sound I'm, better. You sound yeah. better. He was about to tell us some, something about the Olympics in '96. What's up with it? <laughs> you don't. I, We've been waiting. I think, <laughs> no, I was gonna ask you guys' opinion too because I saw a change when all the money came into Atlanta for the Olympics in the '96. Um, I saw a change especially with like dormitories and where everybody was living and um, how much improvement the city uh, put in like all over the city. Cause I know there, there are athletes that stayed um, in uh, dormitories and stuff all around the, uh, the AU campus. Uh, is it just me or did you guys see uh, some improvements from the early nineties to the end of the nineties? In, in uh, after the, the Olympics H came in. In regards to the HBCUs in Atlanta, in, in regards to the Atlanta. Yeah, in, term, in terms of living, like uh, how how things look and, and improve, improvement in housing and what have you. Yeah, I think there's only one human being on the call that can answer <laughs> that. <laughs> I have so much to say about that. Um, I'm trying to target my response. I will say that. Stop holding back. Uh, someone once said that Atlanta invented gentrification. And I don't know that, that, that that's true, but I will say that that probably kind of sums it up. Um, you know, I lived in those dorms. Um, I was an RA for three of my four undergraduate years living in those dorms that uh, were athletes stayed during the Olympics. And they were probably, I don't know, four miles away from um, like the AU center, but literally right in the center of the city. And it was beautiful. I mean, it was literally the best student housing ever. Um, but, you know, right across the street were projects like, you know, my mother used to work at a hotel not too far from there and directly across the street used to be like a whole street full of projects. Uh, an old folks home that was considered, you know, the old folks home for you know, like the project old folks home, um, even the ones you were talking about that were like literally right next to the AUC. Um, but when the Olympics came, they were like, this has to go. This has to go. Um, it has to go. And so now there are some really nice yeah. townhomes. They're old townhomes yeah. now, I guess, there. But mm -hmm. um, in terms of what you see in the city of Atlanta, just four miles, even just right behind the AU Center, it's, you know, it's like every city. They pretty up the nice parts where people are going to be. Um, Oakland does it. They shoo the homeless away, you know, when something big is mm -hmm. coming in town. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, the parts where people aren't going to venture to, they don't bother investing in. Um, and it just happens to be that in Atlanta, and I think also in Oakland, those are the places that are mostly populated by Black and brown people. So, you know. Okay, okay for sure. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if people have been following this. Uh, there's a lawsuit that students at Yale filed. The, um, a lot of Asian student groups, um, well, some, uh, some Asian student groups at Yale filed a lawsuit uh, because they said basically that the school um, is still using race as a factor of getting, getting students in, right? They're still using affirmative action. And they found that black students um, have a much higher percentage of getting into Yale than Asian or white students. Now follow me, follow me on this one. I was just wondering, right? Because if all black students went to HBCUs, then we would have the best sports programs and some of the best scholars. We monopolize all the black talent. And I was thinking, would that be uh, an adequate way to deal with this situation if the top tier black students who got into Ivy Leagues, Ivy League schools all said, you know what, forget this, we're all going to go to HBCUs. Would that, be, would that be an adequate response or would that be a misguided response? I'm just, I'm just wondering what people think about that scenario. Can I ask a question though about that lawsuit and then um, I just specifically about the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. So the Asian Asians were suing because they were unhappy that blacks had a higher chance of getting into Yale than they did? Correct. 
So they 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 felt like it was unfair, and it was it was recently thrown out earlier this year. But they they said that they're going to in Harvard students at Harvard filed a similar lawsuit, and they said that they're going to take it up to the Supreme Court. So yes, they said they did, they did. They they said that they would pursue that. They have not done that yet, but they said that they would pursue that. Yes. Um, so yeah, they said it's not fair because it's easier for these, because um, affirmative action is supposed to be against the law and you're still using it. That's not fair that it's easier for black students to get in than it is for Asian students and white students to get in. Yes, that's, that's, that was their stance, absolutely. They weren't getting their fair share of the quota. Yes, absolutely. I have a comment about that, but I'm going to sit on it before I say it out loud. Let me plug my computer in real quick. I won't. Hey, hold up. No. She's you want to hear it now. I'm going to tie all this filtering going on. Huh? I said bring the smoke. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. I just think it's so the <laughs> affirmative, affirmative action isn't meant to be a quota like so many people think it's supposed to be a quota like we need this many people this many people this many people like it's not that it's to even the playing ground because because like, racism you know, it's not yeah it's not equal and so in order to make it equal you have to make sure that you are taking everyone into account and it's funny how people get upset when black people are actually getting things knowing that we can't get shit elsewhere. <laughs> like we just, like every time we get a win, somebody's like, oh no, black people winning. We can't let that happen. And we end up back at square one. And it's just like, let us have something. You can get in literally wherever you, else you want. Mm -hmm. But this one school that you can get into, you're mad because a black person got in instead of you. Mm -hmm. And that just frustrates me so much because like I studied sociology in college and when I learned how simple all of these problems started out like it all started out with one person who was like you don't deserve this and then mm -hmm. it trickles down and everybody's like oh that's how it's supposed to be and now here we are where people are complaining that other people are getting opportunities that they otherwise probably wouldn't have gotten. And so I'm just mad. Like, why? Why do, why does this keep happening? So we, we know that that happens. And I, I talked about, you know, H, HBCUs oftentimes being in the hood, but in PWI, there's, in predominantly white institutions, there is often hostility, hostility like this. Um, and a lot of it um, even in liberal places like California and the Ivy Leagues, we know that there's really hostility. And I'm wondering, would that be the ultimate flex if we sent our brightest, most overachieving students to HBCUs? Would, would, would that be a proper response? I wanna know what people think about that. I'll say, I think it's a, it's a beautiful dream. I think, um, you know, when I was younger, you know, middle school, thinking about what my college experience would be like, I thought of it that way. Like, you know, I'm, I wouldn't, wouldn't have said best and brightest, but that sort of thinking, like, you know, I was a pretty decent student and, you know, I'm probably better than most. And, you know, I want to go someplace where people like me, you know, people who look like me excel and can, you know, change the world and make it into the world that we want to see. But I think what I didn't kind of consider is that racism is insidious and it is everywhere and there is no place <laughs> where it is not. Um, and so many of the institutions that, you know, we call PWIs directly benefited from enslavement in a particular kind of way that, that automatically kind of, um, makes this dream of sending all black people to HBCUs, you're already, you're still starting from behind. Um, but if it, if it weren't for that, you know, if we really were all on an even playing field, then I, I would love that. That sounds like, you know, that sounds like heaven. 
I mean, and let's just talk about it. HBCUs were forming, form, formed exactly. in the very first place because Black people could not get into the schools white people had. They didn't want them there. They're right. in the hoods because Black people lived in those areas and they started these schools so they could have education. I mean, let's just be real. That's why they are the way they are. And when I think about that comment about what Asians are saying, okay, sorry, you're suffering, you know, you pin where my sister went to school they have so many asians that apply to that school they have to turn them away because they're accepted so so many of them get into you pin that they have to just say you know what we have to put a cap on the number of agents we can accept because they all have these i guess stellar scores to get into you pin right so oh sorry you can you can't go to harvard sorry you can't go to yale go to you i mean it's just like it just is insane to think like you're jealous that you can't go to a school because more black people are getting into that school or whatever distorted thought process you have about that you know i mean and that, and i'll be in black for a day and see if you um want to take that walk you know uh oh uh oh and it's like it's like <laughs> the problem isn't black people y'all the problem it's is not. racism like it, it's not it's not i'm not your enemy here like it's the school you need to deal with the school and their, their standards of how they're ranking people hmm. to admit. Okay, 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 for sure. I mean, I just get so, like, I guess for me, that's why I said, let me sit on this before I just say what came, you know, comes out of my mouth. But it's just like, there are reasons why things are the way they are because they've been set up for black people to not have access, okay? okay? And so schools are now recognizing that they need to give black people access because for, because of laws, right, that had to be in, put in place so Black people could get access to what they already should have had in the first place. So, I don't know. It's like just crazy to me, the thought process about why those laws are there in the first place. It's not to hold people back, it's to let people in that couldn't get in in the first place, that should have been able to get in. And just to add, like, even in the, um, not just the schools, but the workplace, um, Mm. once you get there you still have to prove that you deserve to be there exactly. right it doesn't matter you could have gone to a predominantly white institution and had I don't know whatever other benefits that equate to those who are already there but there's the question of well how did you get here oh they're just using you as a token or you really have nothing substantial but that deserves you to be in this position, especially one of management. Um, so, all right, I know I know it's getting late for my East Coast people. I appreciate y'all. I appreciate y'all staying up. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna wind this thing on down. But lastly, I want to know um, for your children, are you going to guide them towards an HBCU? are a predominantly white institution. I don't want to, oh, it's up to whatever they want to do. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear what are you, in which way are you going to push them? Honestly, um, the local university, state school, or are you going to, um, are you going to recommend to them from their birth and growing up through education that they should go to an HBCU? Uh, I want to, I want to hear from some folk. What do you, what do you think? Let's start with Jason. What's up, Jay? <laughs> Y'all already know <laughs> that, I, <laughs> that I'm I'm gonna say both. Oh. I was saying no, I, I was saying know. that earlier. No. I was saying that you earlier. Towards both, no. <laughs> because you got pros on on both sides. You got pros on on both sides. But I will say this: undergrad, go to the HBCU. Okay, there you undergrad. go. Undergrad. There you go. Yeah, now, because that's going to give you your foundation. You know, once you get that bachelor's degree completed, you're on such much more higher level than you were in the 12th grade. Okay. And that's why I want you to get your foundation at the HBCU. Okay. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I talk about Hampton real quick. Hampton's a very special school, very special school. And uh, Hampton was one special thing about me ending up being an airline pilot 
uh, Hampton has a very strong aviation department okay. and um, has graduated a lot of air traffic controllers and a lot of pilots. Now I was, I was in, you know, pure science, physics and biology and what have you. Uh, but I always wanted to fly planes. I didn't end up being um, an, an aviation major, but if you are into aviation, Hampton is a great school to go and also many other disciplines too. So I would push mine into HBCUs for, for undergrad and then whatever they do after that is gonna be a reflection of life as we've known it since we've all graduated anyway. Okay, for sure. But undergrad, they go into an HBCU. Who else? Who else? Who else? What's up? What's up? What's up? Who else want to weigh in? Where, where the babies going? What's up, Brianna? I, well, first of all, my kids will be like half black, half Filipino. So okay. I don't want to push them to go somewhere where they might feel like they'll be an outsider because I don't know how many, um, I mean, I'm sure there's like mixed people at HBCUs, but I don't, that's a whole complex. Filipino uh, is black. <laughs> exactly. Okay. <laughs> but I I really enjoyed my experience at a PWI um, because we had such a strong black community. I think the black population at my school was eleven percent. But somehow we all had the same lunch hour. We all ate dinner together. We all did these activities together. And it's like all the black people at USC knew each other. And we called it black USC. <laughs> and like we built that community and I was in a lot of social justice programs. And I feel like because I was in an environment where I was an outsider I pushed for that a lot more. I learned more about social justice. I got involved on campus teaching other people about what social justice looks like, what equity looks like. And I don't know if I would get those same um, opportunities at an HBCU because I was teaching equity to white people. Like I was teaching those people who I want to create those changes how they can be a part of that difference um and i feel like that was a really special opportunity and it's something that i continue to do to do today and i'm really glad that i had that opportunity okay for sure so you would rather they go to a pwi than undergrad for undergrad yeah i mean yeah i mean yeah. I, I like my school <laughs> <laughs> it was okay. hard but but it was it was good Okay, for sure, for sure, for sure. Who else, who else? What you, what, what, what's up, Renge? Um, at the risk of saying the white man's ice is better, I am going to say that I probably will send my child to a PWI. Um, high on that list is that we live in a world that is just plain old racist and unless or until that changes, you know, by the time my potential children are college age, um, it just seems like the more, like a better place to prepare them for what the world is actually like, which is kind of what someone commented on in the chat. Um, and I also want to echo what, what was that woman? The last person who spoke, Brianna. Um, I mean, Georgia State probably had like 30% Black students. I mean, I'm sure it's probably the same, but we all knew each other. Like mm. we all found each other. Um, because I think at the end of the day, you, you find the people, you find your people. Um, so I'm reluctantly going to say PWI. But. Okay, 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 sure. And then uh, Reno in the chat says, they want diversity, they want us there at the PWIs. Our magic is predominantly white countries send them to a PWI to get ready for the real PW workforce. Okay, for sure. What's up, Reg? I haven't heard from you today, Better, Better. What's up, man? What about the babies, man? Where are you gonna send the babies? <laughs> you want my? You talking to me? You want my? I'm talking to Reginald. I'm talking to you, <laughs> sir. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, I guess they got a reputation. I don't know if it's deserved. Um, if I had a kid, I'd probably say something like my um, my father told me. And he told me, um, 
those books got the same content on, in each school. They're all the same, just different covers. Mm -hmm. And I would probably add that um, just game the system. Go to the best school you can find and rent this and cost you the least amount of money. And <laughs> your, your, your <laughs> grandmother and me went to UIUC, you probably get a free ride going there. And that'll be it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, for sure. Uh, Mara, what's it going to be? So I know you want us to give a, a, a very specific answer, but what I I'm going to say is this. I did, I did. I did. I'm going to say that I'm going to assess what my child's strengths and weaknesses are, and I'm going to look at them as a whole person, and then I'm going to tell them, go to HBCU anyway. So, like, you know, go to, go to HBCU. <laughs> I don't know. So I guess my, my that's, you know, that's my comic answer, but I just feel like every person is different. Every, my child will maybe be different than me. And I'm just going to assess their needs, what they need the most of, and then send them to that school that will help them grow into the adult they want to be. Okay, for sure, for sure. Appreciate you all. What's up, Holly? You want to weigh in? What's up? I feel like everybody gave the answer that I wanted to give. <laughs> I just wanted the piece of everybody's, but... Um, I just remember when my mom moved to the neighborhood, to this neighborhood, she told me she picked it because she wanted me to compete. Okay. And I feel like listening to everybody else's comments about HBCU um, was enlightening. So I feel like if nothing else, I would give the options where I didn't have that presented to me growing up. Um, so I would push more towards HBCU, but at the end of the day, you know, wherever my child wants to go. Well, look, let me, hold on, hold on, hold on, y'all, man, because I want to, I know, I, I want to let my East Coast people go home, so, uh, or, or lay down at least. Um, hey, look, check it, oh, me, yeah, me, okay, so, <laughs> I would, uh, listen, I'm promoting Berkeley, man. I'm promoting Cal. Uh, you know, if the Chirins, if the Chirins want to go to an HBCU, uh, I'm going to ask them to go to a cheap one, get a whole bunch of scholarship money at that. And then, um, and then, you know, we can, we can talk what I came from, man. I'm a, I'm a promote, I'm a promote, uh, I'm gonna promote Cal. If, if, if my children will probably be rebels anyway. So it's all gravy. You know what I mean? <laughs> Appreciate you all for being on the call. Much love HBCUs or PWIs. We got a whole bunch of educated, righteous, informed Black people. And I love to be in discourse with you all. Peace, tribe. And another one.